Welcome to ASM Studio. Uh, I'm Dr. Jennifer Gardy. I'm one of the program committee members here at Microbe. Um, and in addition to being somebody that works out of a center for disease control, I work at the BC CDC in Vancouver. Uh, I also do a lot of science communication. So I am incredibly excited to see my two worlds come together. I get to sit here and talk and do science communication with an absolutely amazing CDC representative. Uh, Dr. Anne Shukat is our keynote speaker here at Microbe. She's the deputy director at the CDC uh, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention here in Atlanta. And we are so lucky to have you here on our ASM studio stage. So thank you for joining us. Well, thanks so much for having me. I have to say you all look relaxed and cool in your light wear and I'm feeling very <laughs> hot up here in my Delta pilot uniform. <laughs> I need a pilot uniform for conferences. I love it. Um, so we're going to talk a lot about infectious diseases today, my favorite thing and probably your favorite thing too. Um, but I wanted to start with a question about your background. You know, looking out on the faces in the audience here, you can see that we've got a lot of younger scientists. And I think one of the really exciting parts of the microbe conference is for our younger attendees to see their potential future selves reflected in our amazing speakers. So what got you into this chair? today? Yeah. Well, it certainly wasn't on purpose. My plan since I was about eight was to go to medical school, to be a physician, to take care of patients. I had fantastic teachers in college, biology, microbiology, and in medical school, microbiology. But my clinical work as an internal medicine resident in New York City in the mid-80s was in the midst of the AIDS epidemic, where about one out of five patients on our wards were dying from AIDS. So I, I got very passionate about the clinical care I was providing, but I was kind of ready for a break after that training before I went back to clinical, a clinical career. So I came to the CDC for our disease detective program. It's called the Epidemic Intelligence Service, EIS, and it's a two-year program for doctoral level people, either MDs, PhDs, veterinarians, dentists, and so forth. And I just, in that two years, got really hooked on epidemiology and public health and have been at CDC almost 30 years now. Amazing. You know, I think one of the things that's so exciting about the type of work that you and I do in a place like the CDC is it is disease detective work. You are solving mysteries every day. And it's really rewarding to be in an agency, in an entity where you see your work translated into public health policy, into practice, into declining disease rates. So looking back over some of the, the mysteries you've been involved with and the problems you've helped solve, what are some of your favorite ones, the ones you're most proud of? You know, one thing I would mention um, that I don't talk about too much anymore is group B streptococcal infections. Those are infections that um, women can pass to their babies during childbirth. And when I was an epidemic intelligence service officer, I was asked to take on that issue to do surveillance, to look into whether there were prevention opportunities. And what we were able to do was develop guidelines that have now become a standard of care for every mother's every woman in pregnancy, I don't know how many of you have gotten screened for group B strep during your pregnancies, or your moms might have, but since 1996, it's basically been a standard of care and a reduction of disease of about 80%. So it's really um, thousands of babies not getting that infection anymore based on epidemiologic science, not a new randomized controlled trial, but synthesizing the evidence and getting it in front of the clinicians and the organizations that really controlled um, best practices in obstetrics and pediatrics. So that was incredibly gratifying. I did my medical training at a VA hospital in New York, so almost all the patients that I took care of were men. I had hardly any women patients and no children. So the idea that work that I was part of affects every pregnancy now in a positive way is really, really gratifying. A kind of related question to that. Um, so much of the work that we do is geared at changing health public or changing public health policy and practice. Have you ever run into challenges in seeing your work translated, seeing the science that you do actually applied in the field? Yeah, um, you know, I'll talk a little bit about part of this story in the keynote, but not this part. Um, in the in the early '90s, I was sent to um, work with the World Health Organization and local governments on trying to um, do studies of meningococcal conjugate vaccines against group A meningitis in the meningitis belt in West Africa. Um, and we did nice sets of immunogenicity studies and showed there were promising conjugate vaccines. But in the 1990s, there was just no business model for vaccine companies to take that on. 
vaccines were developed for the UK for national use, but they didn't include group A meningococcal disease, which was the kind that caused these big epidemics in Africa. So it was really frustrating to realize that there were products that could solve this huge problem, but there just wasn't the policy or business model for it. But what happened, as you probably all know, is in 2000, when the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation was formed, they were looking for quick wins for low-hanging fruits. They were really interested in rotavirus and pneumococcal vaccines, but they wanted to see if they could demonstrate principles quickly. And so they funded something called the Meningitis Vaccine Project, public-private partnership that eventually led the Serum Institute of India to develop a meningococcal A conjugate vaccine that from the beginning they committed to sell for less than a dollar a dose. And since then, it's been used in campaigns in 26 countries in Africa, and these terrible recurrent epidemics are essentially gone. So my era was the frustration, but this public-private partnership era has just been extraordinary. That kind of leads me to the changing face of public health. It is a different era, whether it's public-private partnerships or just the way we do public health science now. I mean, thinking back to, for example, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa, looking at how public health unfolded there, how the response unfolded, so many different people were involved. It's not just EIS officers, it's not just epidemiologists and microbiologists, it was social scientists, it was anthropologists studying the cultural context of disease, it was economists studying the short and long-term sequelae uh, to an outbreak happening in a low resource setting. It's a really interdisciplinary field now. So how do you see public health as a, as a field unfolding in the next few years and all these other disciplines kind of being brought into the tent? Yeah, you know, the Ebola outbreak in West Africa was just extraordinary on so many levels. But I have to say my mother's an anthropologist and from the day I got to CDC in 1988, she was always asking me, do they have anthropologists? And, you know, look at this AIDS epidemic. You guys need some anthropologists. So, of course, we do have anthropologists, but they were incredibly important in West Africa. You may have heard about the role that burials played in amplifying disease outbreaks because it was the culture in, in those areas that at the funeral, everybody touches the body. That it wasn't just the people preparing the body for um, a burial, but but everyone does, and, and that was the dignified way to send your loved one off. So the fear of getting this terrible disease or, or dying from it was less than the thought that maybe my loved one will not have a safe passage to, you know, to the future. And so it was anthropologists who kind of un uncoupled all of that and figured out designs for safe but dignified burials that would be culturally acceptable because people were you know, hiding their loved ones. They were not, you know, letting people know when someone died. And that exposure to um, the, the, the last days of a, a case of Ebola and the, the, the corpse is just, is just filled with virus, unfortunately. But the other things that you saw in Ebola was, you know, sequencing in the field that helped us figure out that the new cluster in Liberia came from a strain that had been circulating six months before in a different area and helped uncover the idea that the, the disease could be sexually spread. I mean, it was extraordinary. But in terms of the future, I think we'll see even more interdisciplinary, and I think we'll see more public engagement, more involvement of communities of individuals, that a lot of the solutions, even in West Africa, were solutions that came from the community. So as a field, as a discipline, I think us in science really need to see the public, the patients, the consumers, as part of the team, you know, whether it's participatory research or um, really getting some of the hypothesis. You know, I think the first vaccine, the smallpox vaccine, was really the milkmaid said, you know, I already had, um, you know, cowpox and I don't seem to be susceptible to smallpox. And that listening to our public or our, our community is probably really important. I want to go back to the genomics story that you mentioned because I'm a big genomics nerd and spend most of my time sequencing genomes and trying to reconstruct outbreak transmission events. It was a really exciting time for our community too to see this novel technology, you know, portable in situ genome sequencing be used. And so I'm thinking, where do you see future innovation lie? I mean, obviously genomics is huge. We've had loads of talks of it on it here at Micro, but other things too, like the role for data science, for example. Where, where do you see future innovation in public health? Yeah, I, I'm in fact hoping to learn from all of you because I think this hasn't been my focus area, but I, my mind is blown by what we've been able to do recently. Certainly, 
You know, my first trip to West Africa, making a phone call was difficult. We didn't really have faxes even. And so the idea that there could be field sequencing and, you know, the mini, the, it, it's pretty extraordinary. But I do think that um, the potential is just beginning to be seen. You know, um, we at CDC, as I'll say, we're really behind the times in being able to update our systems and incorporate next generation sequencing and genomics into our infectious disease public health work. Public health in general has been left behind. And so I think that um, being able to catch up because we do have so many use cases and so many opportunities, working more closely with industry in terms of the device development and the making the technology useful, making it easy, making it affordable all over the world, I think we'll see you know, even more revolutions. What do you think in terms of how the public health response is changing? You know, part of the story of the, the genomics being so successful was real-time sequencing coupled to data sharing, and not just viral genome sharing, but also metadata as well, information about the sample, time, location, individual. So public health has not been the best at releasing data. We've got a lot of concerns around privacy and there's this tension between, you know, what do we put out there for the public to see? How can we engage the public and the wider community in a response, yet at the same time protect, uh, protect privacy, protect confidentiality? So what does is, what is the future outbreak response look like to you? Yeah, you know, it's so important that um, we figure this out. Um, it's not just, you know, my data for my publication, for my uh, professional development, but they're the countries and the communities where the data arises and their roles in participating. At CDC, we're often waiting for a state to be comfortable with releasing a result, and not even like the, the metadata, but just, you know, that there was a swine flu case or that there was an Ebola case, that that's really the states to say, not ours. And similarly with other countries. But I think in the era of global health security and the international health regulations, countries are recognizing that it's in their interest to report. It's in their interest to share. It's actually in their interest to share the sequence data because the, the solutions can be uh, rap more rapid if that's shared. But we're a long way off. And um, you know, I think the recent privacy issues with some of the companies make people even more scared about what will happen if I share. And certainly, once you get into the genomic level, um, there's a lot that can be done now. So it's, um, we have to solve these issues and they're messy issues and we're getting better, but we have a lot more work to do. Yeah, I think some of it goes back to the community engagement that you mentioned earlier, because if you look in the clinical genomics world, like the human clinical genomics world, patients are really the ones that are driving for better sharing of data to promote and to facilitate discovery. So maybe it does end up coming from the communities. Yeah, I think also it's a question of investment because yeah. I think industry has said like we've got a we have an economic case in, in investing in this. And in public health, we've had to argue why this is essential, why upgrading our systems and having this, um, this shared view of the world is in everybody's interest. So we're, we're slowly getting there, but we're not where we want to be. Yeah. You know, our influenza data is probably the most readily available, rapidly shared, updated for both consumers, the public, policymakers, as well as researchers. But, you know, across the infectious diseases, we haven't had as much capacity as we'd like. We're getting there with foodborne pathogens. We're getting there with the rare isolates so that everybody, all the labs can compare notes. But we do have a lot more work to do. Agreed. Um, I'm going to get a little predictive now. Uh, this is the forecasting section of the interview. Uh, there's been a lot of chat recently on Twitter about um, can you predict the next pandemic? Is it worth even trying to predict spillover events or is it just a, a pipe dream? And we had a wonderful plenary session yesterday here at the conference on the 1918 flu pandemic and lessons learned and how one of the biggest lessons learned is that we're always going to be surprised by the next pandemic. So if you had to look into your crystal ball, apart from saying, you know, I, I can predict that we are going to be surprised and that things are unpredictable, what would you say? You know, what, what, what are you worried about pathogen-wise? Yeah, you know, pa pandemic influenza is almost easy because we know it's going to happen and we know it's going to be difficult and we know that it's not going to happen in the place that we think it's going to happen. You know, we thought it was going to be China and it was Mexico in 2009. Um, and we know that it's going to challenge us no matter what our tools are at that time because a virus that can easily spread, cause severe disease that everybody's susceptible to can wreak a lot of havoc. And we saw just how much havoc we had last year from a severe seasonal strain where we had a lot of partial immunity. The, um, the issue of what's next, I just can't say. I mean, the more I learn, the less I know. You know, 
Who would have thought a mosquito bite would lead to a birth defect and that virus would be sexually spread? You know, that was not on the radar. Zika was on the radar. We'd seen it in Yap. We'd made a PCR to it, but we never expected um, it to be um, transmitted through pregnant women to the fetus and to cause such a horrible neurologic syndrome. So I feel like we have to be ready for everything, but there's ways to do that. It's not, it's not hopeless. You know, we might not have a very specific countermeasure, but we can start to work on countermeasures in a way that's more plug and play. Yep. And we absolutely need every country to have the capacity to detect problems early, to rapidly respond and to prevent them whenever possible. And there's some common things that are low tech, but really important, like infection control. You know, that was critical for SARS, critical for MERS, critical for Ebola. It's not selling a whole lot of money, but making sure that everyone knows how to safely provide patient care without healthcare workers dying. Are there any gaps that you see sort of in the current microbiology slash public health research agenda that you think really urgently need filling if we are going to be better prepared? Well, you know, I, I do think that um, the problem of antimicrobial resistance is, you know, um, our generation's huge challenge that although we've known microbes were always adapting and becoming resistant, it's really at a crisis point now with the spectrum of pathogens and the mechanisms that are so easily transferable and the end of the line on, on drugs. And because we're so used to antibiotics being there for common things like transplants, dialysis, C-sections, we have to really stop and think, how are we going to preserve our antibiotics and reduce the risk of these pathogens emerging? And we can do a super duper job in our hospital or in our healthcare facility, but we need the whole facilities in the community to work. Then we find out it's not just our country's facilities because some of these pathogens are coming after people have health care in another country. So we really need to work on antibiotic stewardship and on early detection response to new emerging resistance patterns. And I think that's going to be a problem for a generation, not just a problem for the next couple of years. So people starting out, there is a lot of room for work there, you know, work in diagnostics. So we know what's going on better and sequencing provides a lot of opportunity work in uh, behavior change, infection control, antibiotic stewardship, and work in the healthcare industry in terms of how to make things safer. We've got about 10 minutes left in Microbe Studio, and there's a lot of you out there. Um, so I know there's a couple of burning questions, surely, out in the audience. We do have some enticing microbes to give you if you... Um, you can say that the CDC deputy director gave you flu uh, if you ask a great question. Uh, so Ray has got the microphone. Ray's right in the middle there. If you've got a question for Dr. Shukat, uh, throw your hand up in the air. Okay, great. There we go. Hi, thank you for being here. Um, so you were talking about antimicrobial stewardship being one of on the forefront of importance. So from your personal experience, how would you go about maintaining antimicrobial stewardship. What, are, what is your work plan in your mind? Thanks. Um, you know, we did a lot of work on this in the 1990s in pediatrics. And part of the issue was, um, how do you change pediatricians' behavior? And it wasn't just a question of knowledge. It turns out you can know what the right thing is to do, but it's hard to do it. And, and the two things we realized were we had to influence the clinicians and we had to influence the parents. And we actually did lead to decreases in antibiotic use in pediatrics through issuing principles for appropriate antibiotic use and through a series of interventions like academic detailing, you know, visiting the clinics and, and giving feedback about what you as a clinician were doing versus your peers. It turns out in the medical and health profession, there's a lot of type A people who want to make sure they get an A plus. When you find out I'm doing worse than everybody else in my town, it's, it can help start to change your behavior. But we also found out we had to, we had to target the consumers, the parents. It, when we did focus groups and in-depth interviews, we found out that clinicians were giving out antibiotics because they thought the parents wanted them. Parents were asking for antibiotics or getting antibiotics because they thought the doc said that's what my child needed. And there was a total misunderstanding there. But we also have learned, I mean, the field has learned a lot, you know, from behavioral economics and from like fields like nudge, you know, about how do you make it easy for people to change. And if you look at clinician behavior for prescribing antibiotics, early in the day, they're doing the right thing, you know, after lunch, a little bit worse, and then by the end of the day, just forget it, you know, let me out of there. So we have to find ways that 
it's easier to do what, what, is, what you're trying to do and um, harder to do what's not appropriate, whether that's adding barriers or not. We have the same problem right now with opioids, that we have to be changing prescription practices around that. We didn't realize how harmful they were. Same thing as antibiotics. We didn't realize the harms. We thought it was no big deal. We tried to deal with pain, be on the safe side, and it turned out we were making things riskier. How do you get those nudges? How do you get behavior change frameworks incorporated into agencies like CDC, where generally the focus tends to be on the bug, on the disease? How do you pull those other disciplines in and make sure they're really well integrated into the whole ecosystem? Yeah, you know, I think that um, interdisciplinary teams are really important. Um, I talked about groupie strep earlier, and I can say that in the mid-90s, we hired our first um, communication person for groupie strep. And we thought she was gonna help us like with brochures. And she explained like, that's not what communication people do. You know, I'm gonna tell you if you need a brochure, which you probably don't. And there's probably a whole other thing that you need. But um, I have so much, um, I think in my career, I have seen the public and consumers really have a lot of influence in patient safety. You know, asking your doc, have they gotten a flu vaccine? Have they washed their hands? Um, I really think communities can have a big role. It, actually, in Group B Strep, they had a big role because they said, why don't you guys do something about this? You know, there's an intervention that works. Why is it taking so long to make it mainstream or to make it a standard of care? Let's take another one from the audience. All right. Uh, greetings. It was a pleasure to listen to your talk. I was hoping to hear your thoughts about the uh, relationship between science and the public in terms of infection control. You know, we've seen the return of some illnesses that we didn't have around because of things like vaccine denial. And I was wondering what your thought of the magnitude of that problem was and what we can do as scientists and science advocates to counter it. Yeah, thanks so much uh, about uh, the sort of the question of the um, science advocates. Um, one thing we were chatting about beforehand, I mean, I think all of you as scientists need to also view your role as communicators, that you need to be able to explain what you're doing to people who don't do what you do. And that can be hard for some of the very technical work that you're doing, but it's really important to expand um, awareness and understanding of science as a discipline. But you know, when it comes to vaccines and parents' concerns, um, information is not enough. Um, people can be very um, savvy about information, but um, suspicious. And so the way that you communicate if you're a healthcare professional, the way that you talk about vaccines to people who are considering them is as important as what you say. To make sure that you express concern, compassion, or open and honest is probably more important than all the facts you may know. Because um, if somebody doesn't trust you, they're not gonna listen to you. You know, we've, we, we know there's a lot of data about the safety of vaccines, and there's data about some vaccines that weren't so safe. But when it comes to that conversation, it comes down to um, building trust and sustaining it, being trustworthy, being open and honest, um, knowing your facts, but making sure that you're expressing, you know, that you're getting to the bottom of why is a person concerned? It can be so important to just respectfully listen, to ask, well, what are you worried about? And then to get to your SACO of, you know, based on what I do know, this is what I would do for my family, what I recommend for you. So we think kind of changing that dynamic a little can help. It will definitely not work on people who are very hard and fast on an extreme view. But for the majority of the public, it's at least in terms of vaccines, they're pretty open and their main concern is the health of their kids. There's a lot of really interesting scholarship around uh, how do you communicate well. And I have to say, uh, CDC has some of the most impressive resources I've seen. Um, if you're ever having to communicate around a public health crisis or emergency, the uh, CERC, C-E-R-C, -E Crisis and Emergency Response uh, Center, I guess it is, has incredible resources. And they boil it down to three things, be first, be right, and be credible. Yeah, I think we've learned the hard way that we have to put communication up front. You know, in 2001, with the bioterrorist anthrax attacks, um, you know, right on the heels of, of um, World Trade Center attack, um, public health wasn't out the door fast in terms of the communication and the credible voice. And we never, we never recovered. Um, that was a particularly challenging event for the country, you know, to have terrorist attack on our mail system but it was also a learning experience. And after that, CDC really invested in training 
staff in crisis communication. We built a TV studio in our basement so that we wouldn't have to leave campus in order to be available for interviews and we could do our responses and do our interviews. And I can tell you the first week of the H1N1 influenza pandemic, it was Secretary Sebelius' first week on the job. Basically, I met her her first day and we went to Congress to talk to them. But she, she pretty much always had a physician with her. She said, you know, listen to the doctor. She had me or Tony Fauci or somebody else. And it was a, um, let me be the politician. Let's get the scientists or health professional to answer the questions about this. Um, but we as scientists or health professionals really need to know how to talk in a way that um, the public can understand, giving them things to do, giving them um, a, a sense of what we do and don't know. And, and a fundamental is to be um, honest. You know, if you don't know, say you don't know. It might be counter to all those tests you had to take, but you basically want to say when you don't know something that you don't know it, that you are, look, you know, what you're doing to find out, but you never want to get ahead of the knowledge that you have. We've got time for one more from the audience. Hopefully somebody who I can easily throw something to. Ray, there's one. Oh, we'll do two more. Let's go, let's go there, because Ray's going, and then we'll go to you. Thank you. Um, to follow up on the idea of vaccines, you know, 20 years ago, you never thought about vaccinating an expectant mom. Right. And that's clearly a good indication now. So what are your thoughts in terms of how do we push that forward as well? Yeah, thank you. The question's about um, vaccinating pregnant women. And, and you know, the influenza pandemic really... Um, in 2009 really changed attitudes because we saw in our generation, we saw women die in, in, you know, from influenza during pregnancy. If pregnancy does it really increase the risk of hospitalization or death. And obstetricians really changed, sort of mix, shifted from when in doubt, don't, to when in doubt, do vaccinate. Um, and of course, now we found that we actually have to give um, pert pertussis vaccine in pregnancy because the vaccine the highest risk is the first couple months of life and vaccinating everybody around the baby isn't enough. You have to vaccinate during pregnancy. So we're seeing a change slowly, but I think the group B strep story is relevant and there's exciting research going on around the world to look at the promise of group B strep vaccines. We always thought that our, antibiotic, our prenatal screening and antibiotics in labor was an interim step. I'm really hoping that we're not gonna have the killer drug resistant group B strep, you know, uh, cross, across the country or complications of antibiotics in pregnancy be a big problem. But we'd always hoped that maternal vaccination would be the answer. The other thing is RSV vaccines. And again, this very early, very severe disease in children. Right now, the leading respiratory pathogen in children that's left, the serious pathogen, um, very promising vaccines being tested. So I think in other countries, especially in the developing world, Vaccinating in pregnancy is just totally accepted because women have been getting tetanus toxoid in pregnancy for, for dec uh, decades. But I think with the flu vaccination and the, the tetanus, the Tdap vaccination that we're seeing now, there's more openness. And I think pediatricians will probably push pretty hard if we get an effective RSV vaccine to incorporate that into um, messaging for, um, for parents. We've got one more from the crowd. Hi, my name is Eva Chebyshev. I'm an undergrad at Ithaca College in upstate New York. Um, I'm a rising senior, and I was just wondering if the CDC had any opportunities, um, like a post back program, um, or funds some kind of program like that for after undergrad but before grad school? Yeah, thank you for that question. Um, we do have something, and first I'll say our website, on, uh, our website cdc.gov slash fellowships, has all of the different training opportunities that we have. We have a relatively new program called the Public Health Associate Program, or PHAP. And that, um, we have between 100 and 200 new PHAPs every year. They're usually college grads. Uh, some of them have masters, but it's not required. And they are placed in local health departments around the country, but heavily mentored by CDC headquarters staff. They start the program with a big training in Atlanta, meeting their peers, and then get dispatched around the country. We've had PHAPs assigned to different county health departments, but then come into our emergency operations center during responses. We sent several PHAPs to Puerto Rico during the Zika response. They helped us with Ebola. You know, they've been very, very critical. And then in the front line in the local health departments, they're working side by side with public health professionals. It's, it can be a great point in your career to get a taste of public health. A lot of them will stay in public health. Many will go to grad school, but it gives them a chance to say, what kind of grad school do I want to go to? 
Um, and I think it's a, it's a pretty exciting program. The one downside is it has become incredibly competitive. So the program leaves the applications up for two weeks because if they have them up for longer than two weeks, they just can't manage the applications. But it's been a really um, exciting one. It's about five or six years old. And I strongly encourage you, if you're in that stage, I'm not sure, you know, you'll really get a sense of what hands-on public health is about. A uh, follow-up question. Uh, can you defer your loans during that period? Um, we, we don't have that right now, but I can tell you it's something that we're really looking at. We're trying to get um, public health service of different types to be considered amongst the things that are really, you know, serving the community. Um, there's active discussion, but we don't have it yet for that. But it's a paid, it's a paid job. It's not, you know, a free, it's not an internship that's unpaid. It's a paid two-year program. Please join me in thanking Dr. Shukut for a fantastic discussion.